Uh, two lovely quotes, um, and I didn't know who the first one was from, and I didn't know who the second one was from. Mm -hmm. But Daniel Willingham uh, says, memory is the residue of thought. As in, the more we think about things, the more we remember them. And uh, the other one, and if anyone knows where that was from, because I couldn't remember as I was on the train yet. Uh, from Heb, thank you very much. Um, so it's the Hebbian idea that neurons that fire together wire together. So that's great, basically bits of your brain that sort of ping off at the same time, form associations between them. Again, gratuitously horribly simplified, but it hopefully will help us. Um, so we have then other ideas that if you try and put too much into working memory and you go beyond the five, six, seven things in there, we get overload. And uh, everyone has feel, had that feeling of overload where there's too much stuff being shoved at you and your working memory is overloaded and you can't then possibly make sense of that and store it nice and neatly in long-term memory. Uh, so we've got this problem of overload. Um, and then we've got this issue about chunking. So chunking essentially is when you get a, a number of memories that come together in, in short-term working, short working memory and they get associated together and rather than having to think of each of those elements separately, they become one element together. It's a bit like when I say strawberry, everybody sees the image of the strawberry and they associate it with the colour red and little yellow dots and green bits and a smell. And all those times, they gradually sort of fade away. Uh, two lovely quotes, um, and I did know who the first one was from and I didn't know who the second one was from, mm -hmm. but Daniel Willingham uh, says, memory is the residue of thought. As in, the more we think about things, the more we remember them. And uh, the other one, and if anyone knows where that was from, because I couldn't remember as I was on the train yet. Heb. Uh, from Heb, thank you very much. Um, so it's the Hebbian idea that neurons that fire together wire together. So that's great, basically bits of your brain that sort of ping off at the same time, form associations between them. Again, gratuitously horribly simplified, but it hopefully will help us. Um, so we have then other ideas that if you try and put too much into working memory and you go beyond five, six, seven things in there, we get overload, and uh, everyone has feel, had that feeling of overload where there's too much stuff being shoved at you, and your working memory is overloaded, and you can't then possibly make sense of that and store it nice and neatly in long-term memory. Uh, so we've got this problem of overload, um, and then we've got this issue about chunking. So chunking essentially is when you get a, a number of memories that come together in, in short-term working, short working memory, and they get associated together, and rather than having to think of each of those elements separately, they become one element together. It's a bit like when I say strawberry, everybody sees the image of the strawberry, and they associate it with the colour red, and little yellow dots, and green bits, and a smell, and all those things, and all I need to do is say strawberry, and you have a chunk which is related to strawberry, rather than every time I say strawberry, I have to then explain what red is and what yellow is and what that smell is and what it feels like and the different textures and the tastes and the wet sensation when you have it and all those sorts of things. So, broadly speaking, this idea of chunking um, is when we experience some things and they sort of get chunked together and then they go back into our long-term memory and then we can recall them as one lump rather than lots of separate things which would overload our working memory. Now the trouble is, once we've got these associations together, it's very difficult to learn. If, one, if you just happen to have in your head that all strawberries are blue, and they've got the green bit on top, and they have that taste and that smell and so on, then if you suddenly start seeing red strawberries, it's going to be really, really hard to go, like, oh my goodness, that's really wrong, that's what a crazy strawberry that is. And if suddenly everyone around you is telling you that strawberries are a different colour, then it's actually going to be quite hard for you to forget one element of that chunk. Because they're all bound together, this idea of red and strawberry taste and, uh, and the, the colour uh, and, and the smell and all those sorts of things, they're all bound together. So unlearning these chunks of knowledge is actually very, very hard once they're there. And it's even harder not just to sort of forget about them, but actually change an idea, a, a sort of a chunk of knowledge in your head from something that you really know to something slightly different. It's really, really hard to do that because if I see one blue strawberry, then I might go, oh, okay, right, well, someone's told me that strawberries are blue, so I can begin to start thinking strawberries blue, but actually it's much, much easier to then go straight back to the strawberries are red bit because that was the much stronger association. And actually it takes a while and a lot of effort to kind of weaken that association and strengthen that association so that your first instinct will be blue strawberries rather than red strawberries. It's very, very hard to do. It takes a lot of time. And the trouble is, if all of us saw a blue strawberry now, there would be a cognitive dissonance thing, this whole feeling of, whoa, 
that's not that's it's kind of a bit like this chunk of information but it's not quite like it there's something that's wrong here it's standing out I've got a klaxon going off in my head it feels really painful it's unpleasant so we kind of say I'd rather not look at blue strawberries that's just too freaky for me um, so what we're trying to do in terms of learning, and this is true teacher learning and student learning, essentially what we're trying to do is strengthen these chunks. And we're saying that, uh, first of all, the first time you experience this, we'll get just a few elements together. Uh, here's a nice red strawberry with a nice smell. And then we're going to show you those things. That's a strawberry. goes into your working memory. And then we'll maybe go through that process again, because from recalling it, associating them again and pushing it back together, you strengthen it and recall it again and push them together again and uh, strengthen it, then that memory becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And then eventually we can start saying, let's just use strawberry as an idea and let's have strawberry and agriculture. And I don't, now that I'm saying strawberry and agriculture, you know a bit about agriculture, you know a bit about strawberries, and I don't have to do strawberries red and yellow with green and smell and blah, and agriculture blah and blah and blah and blah and blah, because working memory will be overloaded. So essentially, by turning it into chunks, we can then take the whole chunk as a single item in working memory. And then suddenly we can make more complicated associations. Um, so in terms of the external environment, there are also, it's actually, I mean, if you think about it as babies, you start off with just concrete sensations. You don't have any abstract thinking about, you know, uh, about what's the square root of minus one or, you know, what is, uh, what is the meaning of life. You don't have any of those abstract thoughts in your head when you've when you are born, you can just get concrete sensations, and through the concrete sensations and mixing them together, we create various thoughts together. So lots of things, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling, what I'm hearing, and what I'm feeling for my stress levels and my empathy and various other things like that. Thinking about teachers, how they learn things then, actually lots of the things we're going to learn are going to be through what we are experiencing in our classroom, and uh, we are then going to bring all those things together. This is now really pointless, but I just, hey, look, this is something being chunked. <laughs> uh, I did that over lunchtime. Oh. Um, anyway, so um, it's sort of massively simplified. So let's talk teaching then. So um, teachers have to construct lots of knowledge which they use in the classroom, and it has to be something really, really quick uh, because what we don't have as teachers is time to kind of stop ask a pupil a lot of questions about what they do and then pause the lesson, go away, open up our textbook and have a bit of a think, ponder, you know, using quite sort of, uh, <coughs> using quite discursive sort of things and quietly thinking to myself and then make a decision. I just have to see and react and see and react and see and react. Um, and we therefore have to construct the practice that we do from our classroom experience. I see that, um, but also the theory which we get. So um, what we can't do is if teachers have never been in a class and construct everything theoretically, then that won't actually be linked to practice. So actually, if you've got a totally theoretical only knowledge, and then you go into the classroom, your brain's going to be, your mind's going to be blown because all these different things in the classroom are not nice little chunks of knowledge. They're just a massive load of stressful input from the classroom, which I can't possibly link to theory. Similarly, if I start off only knowing what I'm doing in the classroom and I kind of just figure stuff out and I don't think fix it to knowledge, then I'm going to create some vague theories early on, but I'll never actually associate that with the theory later on. So actually, clearly, we need a process where people are gradually introduced to classroom stimulus and theoretical stimulus at the same time, and start, and then un unpick these ideas, put them back together again with theory, and put them back into our brains again. So that's what we need to do. These chunks are very rapidly uh, put together in initial teacher education. So when you're a new teacher, um, as Joe was saying actually earlier, about your massive cognitive overload all the time, you're stuck in front of that classroom, there are 30 children doing crazy things and there's just a, lot, a whole load of sensory noise coming at you, plus loads of stuff inside from the stress um, and this whole feeling of this is happening and the overload is enormous. But there are so many things happening all the time, you have to start chunking things together for sheer survival. So you begin to go child does that is naughty. And of course you also bring some of the chunks you had from when you were in school, which is why a lot of teachers of course will start relating their practice to practice they saw in the classroom because those are the chunks of memory they've got in their heads already. So um, this, it gets harder and harder. Essentially once we've started making meaning out of what we're seeing in the classroom it gets harder to change that meaning and change the way we think about our teaching. Now I would suggest I don't have evidence for this, I would suggest that this is related 
to the Hanischek study, and this wasn't his graph, this is a sort of a pictogram representation. Essentially what he said was that in the first few years of teaching, there is quite a strong correlation between the time you're in the classroom and the impact you are having on learning outcomes. But actually as time goes on beyond year three or four, that correlation weakens significantly. And actually, so of course some teachers will continue to improve their impact, some teachers won't. Um, in, in, as I say, that's, that wasn't a direct graph, it's more of a pictorial representation of the concept that in your first couple of years you tend to improve quite quickly, everybody does, or else you have to leave the classroom because you probably didn't survive. But actually after that, there are other factors at play of how we improve. Now if we think about what does professional learning actually require, there's lots of things. We need to be aware we had to have a toolkit of all the different sorts of things we can do in the classroom. All the different techniques, all the different approaches. We need to, on the other corner, understand the underlying theory of all of those. Why do they work? Why do I know when to use them or when to refine them and adapt them or chuck them away? We need to be able to adapt any idea that we've got really quickly, combine approaches, refine them, and that's got to be something that can be done very, very quickly in the classroom as well as slightly more slowly in planning. The top middle one is one that we don't talk about anywhere near enough. We talk a lot about answers and techniques, but we really don't talk enough about how good teachers are at recognising a situation and what is then needed. That's a big problem, actually, in classrooms. We don't help teachers look at learners and say, what is it that is actually going on here? What's the gap between where I want these students to be and where they are now? Because actually then we can then pick from our toolkit, and sometimes we just give teachers more in the toolkit without giving them any better understanding of how and when to use them, and that's a real problem. Um, I had this uh, experience that as soon as I joined Twitter, I had this massive wash of ideas coming over me, and uh, I always tell this story, but um, every time um, I would then go and teach my year 10s during the first year of joining Twitter, i say, right guys, I've got this fantastic new approach, and they go, oh sir, it's another one of your Twitter ideas. Say, yes, yes it is, and someone said, it's not going to last more than a fortnight, is it? Well, cutting, but true. Uh, no systematic use of anything. Uh, so ev everything was just completely crazy, unsystematic. And then ultimately, of course, we need as professionals to be able to reflect and think, have a, a sort of a meta-thinking approach. Think about the learning itself. How do I actually begin to think about what happened today and reflect on its success? Because, of course, by recalling what happened today and bringing ideas out of long-term memory to working memory, forming associations, maybe going and reading some theory, connecting it all together and gradually putting it back again. If I haven't got the right theory, of course, that's not going to work so effectively. That's really complicated. There's lots of stuff. And that's not even everything. There are loads of other things. I haven't put anything about motivation there. I haven't put anything about all sorts of areas, but just already there's lots of bits of stuff we need to think about. Now, the CPD challenge, so this idea that actually just professional, and by CPD I don't mean courses, I mean everything, <coughs> professional learning. Um, the challenge is, for more experienced teachers, a lot of the experience is already chucked together, quite specific ways, and for each different teacher it will be pre-constructed of different bits and the difficulty is, we don't just want to load new ideas and say, take that chunk and add a piece on and then stick it back again. We want people to rethink things and take things out, disconnect the chunk, and actually maybe take one piece out, put another bit of theory in because that works better, and then put it back, make it more nuanced. But the problem is, we rarely get the opportunity when people are doing dissemination or sharing good practice to do it in such a way that it really will <coughs> Take that, that chunk, which was already associated together, disassociate it, and associate it in a different way. That's the big problem in CPD. Do we send teachers on courses? <laughs> okay. So, like this slide, thank you very much to Paul and Philip uh, from, from Curate and all your Curate colleagues. So, uh, what they did was um, look at a number of, sample number of courses from the TDA database, and look, essentially, match the characteristics of those courses to four different levels, the highest of which was transformative. Is this something that will transform practice in the classroom? This slide is, is deliberately a little bit harsh than it needs to be, because there were actually plenty of other good levels below. But I just only wanted to focus on the transformative bit. And essentially, 1%, once you average across...